So it's good to see you all this morning. I uh, hope that uh, you're able to stay for our, our potluck. It's the first one we've had in years. And um, it might be a little rusty at doing it, but I hope that uh, you at least stay and enjoy a fellowship conversation. And, and uh, honestly, our food is a good time to, maybe not today, but I find sharing a meal is when you actually get to know people. When you, you know, especially as years go on, it's, it's like the minute you actually like share what's actually on your mind or on your heart, find the uh, eating together is some of the best time to do that. One of the things I like about attending a more Korean style international church was they had it every week. And while it is a hassle and a headache, to be honest, um, what it does is it just kind of pushes people together. It, it encourages you can't get, get away from them in a sense. I've seen marriages saved because of it. I've seen really wild things happen because of that fellowship. And to be honest, in the Western church, we don't experience that as much. So it's a good thing. I don't. It, it is tough. I'm not asking you to do it every week, but it's a good thing. So take that moment and uh, if you can, enjoy it. Our website's updated a little bit to express that our potluck will be, uh, I believe, every third Sunday. And uh, there's some other updates on there, just so if you need to know what's going on with our uh, children's church, or potluck, et cetera, it will be there in the announcements section on the website. We have been in our sermon series um, for about 20 Sundays. Um, it's called The Story, simply because every bit of scripture points towards God. It's his story. It's about him. It's about how he is going to find a way to join us and to live with us. Like his presence directly <coughs> among all his people. In a different way than we can even experience now, where Christ himself will be king. This has been his goal from the Garden of Eden. And is what he will accomplish in the future. Genesis 21 is uh, kind of anticlimactic because in Genesis 21, this is where everything that Abraham and Sarah had waited for, the, the promised child, this promised child who would not just be a miracle, but would be the one through which God would crush the head of the devil, would be the one through which God would make possible living among his people. Jesus Christ himself is the descendant of Abraham. But it's impossible. Abraham can't have kids. He's uh, very advanced in years. His wife is very advanced in years. And she can't have birth. It's an impossibility. And in this chapter, she does. And in eight verses, it's over. I mean, think about that. You had from Genesis 12 all the way up to Genesis 21, them waiting. You see the process. You see them trusting God, and then the child's born, and it, it's just over. And eight verses on it, this goes on to the next challenge. It's, it's really realistic. That's how life is. We focus on winning. We focus on success, and that moment where we can say, I've done it, but it ends up not being not that big of a deal as we thought. It's a big deal, but it's not quite what we thought it would be. It turns out that most of our life is process. And that process is way more important than just achieving some result. So we're in Genesis 21. Verse 1, the Lord visited Sarah, just as he said he would, and did for Sarah what he had promised. When never God visits, it's, it's an unusual kind of way to put it. Whenever God visits, he does something that can't be done. It, it's, uh, it's not simply he just shows off. Whenever he visits, it has this idea of it's in the special interest of a person or it's a particular judgment of sin. It's an intimidating kind of word, and yet it's an all-inspiring thing. God shows off. And when he does, he did exactly what he had promised. Him. And so, impossibly, Sarah became pregnant and bore Abraham a son in his old age 
at the appointed time that God had told him. Abraham named his son, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac, a little laughter. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him just as God had commanded him. Now, Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has made me laugh, which again, that's what Isaac's name means. Throughout this chapter, you have to play on words of laughter. <coughs> Everyone who hears about this will Isaac will laugh together with me. Then she says, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah could nurse children? The answer is no one, because it can't happen. It's an impossibility. The impossible is happening. Yet, she says, I have given birth to a son for him in his old age. In verse 8, the child grew and was weaned. This was typically done a little later. In the Western world, we tend to wean around a year or so, but in much of the rest of the world, it's usually around age three. More common. So Abraham prepared a great feast in the day that Isaac was weaned. That kind of great moment comes and goes in eight verses it's over. There's, you'd expect more. You'd expect, you know, the trumpets to be blasting and, you know, like 12 chapters about this. But no, it, it's, it just moves on. It moves on in a way that we might not be completely comfortable with. The very next thing you see is kind of dark. Um, and honestly, it, as it, it's meant to be read this way. It's, that feeling you have when you see the next verse is you're meant to feel that. You're meant to, if anything, identify with it. Really, for both the person who's being hurt and the one who's hurting, you should be able to identify with both. But Sarah noticed the son of Hagar. The son whom Hagar had born to Abraham, laughing. And it's a similar word. But it's laughter with perhaps it's a negative sort of laughter. And it's not Hagar doing anything in particular. It's the son who's um, described as a lad, he's described as a boy, which could be anywhere between uh, like four or five up to an like, upper teenage. But it's expected that he's probably 10. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. He's not much older. And that's because in later verses, you know, she takes him by the hand and she's uh, treating him like you treat someone who's really small and young. But he's old enough to walk, but he's, he's at the point where he's just a foolish kind of middle school age kid, perhaps. He's silly. And he's doing something he should not have done. Very unwise. But it's a little bit of an extreme reaction you have from Sarah. So she said to Abraham, banish, notice the language, it's told very much from her perspective here, banish that slave woman, doesn't name her, um, and her son, not your son, Abraham. He says, and your, and that woman's son, not your son, for the son of that slave woman will not be an heir along with my son. Isaac. Not much laughter going on now. Sarah's demand displeased Abraham greatly because Ishmael was his son. That's his boy. Yeah, he messed up and shouldn't have done it. And often we read it from the perspective of, you know, where we are now. But in his place, that's his son, regardless of how the boy was born. That's his. He loves him to death. When it says this word displeased, it might not quite ring a bell with Austin. Displeased seems kind of mild to me. Um, but while we don't know exactly how he reacted, it is kind of left to the imagination. Let's look at some other times the word displeased is used. Displeased would be the term that King Saul would use when he saw David being praised instead of him. And all the nations are singing about David. He is raging. Next to murder. The, 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 the word displeased is never used as mildly upset. It is much more accurate, perhaps, to translate it as Abraham is furious. He is enraged. Bitterly, bitterly angry. When, when God says to talk about him being displeased, uh, there's often death follows very quickly. 
displeased. E evil on the site is the same Hebrew word as to be displeased. The same, same word, evil in the eye. In uh, 2 Samuel 11, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband Uriah was dead, she mourned for him because David had her husband killed, essentially. When the time of mourning passed, David had brought had her brought to his palace, she became his wife and she bore a son. But what David had done, displeased, was upset, was evil in the eye of the Lord. But only in Genesis 21 is ever, is the only time someone's described as very displeased. He is more than a little upset. He incredibly, incredibly angry. The reason he reacts this way is because, of, again, it's, it's his boy, it's his son. But God said to Abraham, don't be upset about the boy of your slave wife. Oddly, he says this, do all that Sarah is telling you, or you could also translate it, obey everything that Sarah is telling you, the same words used through Isaac, your descendants will be counted. But I will also make the son of a slave wife into a great nation, for he is your descendant too. So here, this is, you, maybe, if you're a Christian for any length of time as an adult, you have that kind of situation. It's written like this because, it, first of all, it's real. Second, this is art. It's, Genesis is art. And it's real art. And it's, it speaks to you in a way that you should be able to identify with. Maybe you've been in a situation like Abraham or Sarah or Hagar or that boy. You've probably been all of them in some. And so each one of them, you know where they're coming from. You know where Sarah's coming from. She's waited for one thing her whole life, felt pathetic, like a loser. And finally, she, she has a child and there's a threat and she reacts. Uh, I can understand that. It's self-preservation. It's not right, but you understand her. And in a technical sense, she does need to protect the Lord. That doesn't excuse her lack of graciousness. You probably understand Abraham too. He's caught between a person who is kind of right and a person he should be protecting. There is no good solution. There's, no, there's nothing going to come of this that's happening. Maybe you've been there. If you were an adult for any length of time, you have been. Maybe you've been Hagar, who you're, she didn't ask for this. She was taken she was a slave. Um, the boy did this. He lacked. And maybe you could blame her indirectly, but it's not her that did it. It was Ishmael. Maybe you've been Ishmael, though. Just foolish and laughing at the wrong time or doing something really dumb that you shouldn't have done. He just does it, and then, wow, this is a bit of an overreaction, right? Being driven from my dad's house. That's, maybe you've been all of those four. But God is good at dealing with these horrible human-made problems. God didn't do any of this. God promised Abraham that he'd have a son, and Abraham tried to make it happen with Sarah and, and, and figure out how to make God's promise happen because he really wants God's promise, but his wife can't have a child. So they said, well, what about Hagar? It was culturally acceptable to have a wife through uh, a servant. It was normal. It happened all the time. There was even laws related to managing it. It was very common. But it wasn't what God had said. And so they tried to solve it. So and they, these are, it's a human-made problem, and God has to come in and solve the mess with all puzzle pieces that are all mangled up. How do you put this back together? It's not going to be really pleasant for anyone, but God remains compassionate. Being technically right, and this digs at me, because I, I can often use this as a tool just to like make my way. Being technically right doesn't make me right. And Sarah is technically right. But she's not doing the right thing. And the same thing, Sarah protecting her son, even, even putting Hagar somewhere else, all of that could have been accomplished much more graciously. 
Early in the morning, you can imagine Abraham waking up, just like in the next chapter. Waking up with his shoulders slumped, just feeling worse than he ever had in his whole life. Gathering together some food and a skin of water. I mean, these are big skins of water. These are, these are big giant things. They carry 30 liters of big. And these men just carrying all this stuff over. He gave him the Hagar. And in a kind of very personal, intimate way, he, he, you can see him walking up to her and, as it says in the verse, just putting it on her shoulders, the food and the water. And then he takes his son's hand and he, he gives the child to Hagar. It's heartbreaking. And sends her away. So, she's lost. She doesn't know what she's doing. She doesn't think she's going to make it. She just wanders aimlessly south through the wilderness of Beresh. Uh, the water in the skin was gone. She dumped, or you could say shoved, like it is here in the NDT, the child under one of the shrubs. You know, in the shade. There's no more water. It's over for her. It's her life has been a disaster. Then she went and sat down herself across from him at quite a distance, about a bow shot away, for she thought, I refuse to watch the child die. So she sat across from him and wept uncontrollably. To dump someone in the bush like that is the same word used for Joseph, when his brothers abandoned him, just leaving him essentially by himself, alone, without anybody in the hole they made for him before they decided to sell him. Abandoned. So, my question as I'm reading this, this is again put together like this on purpose. It's not an accident that it goes from the birth of Isaac, the great moment, to this awful moment. It's not an accident it's put there on purpose. The question I have, maybe you have as you look at your own life, is this. Why does it have to happen like this? Why does it have to happen like this? Well, we know the answer, but let's make you feel about it. It happens like this because we do really, 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 really bad things. We make this happen. We make this happen. The world's problems are the ones that we make. God's just sorting through it, saving as many as he can. Abram and Sarah created this particular mess, and I've created my own. I'm sure you're, you've created yours. Or you're on the way to it. These are deeply flawed people who definitely believe what God said. And there are far worse people in the world than Abraham. Um, by, I think, world standard, if you really look at him objectively, he's a really good person. I know that sounds wild, but if you put you in that situation in the ancient world, I don't think you would fare better. They're like us. They're flawed, they're imperfect. And Abraham himself is probably wondering, is this, I don't know, in this kind of dark moment, he's, he watches his son walk away. He's probably thinking, is this the result of everything that God promised? Is this even worth it? Why does God let this happen? Why? Hagar herself had a little role in all of it. She was a slave. Sarah was a mess, to be honest, and miserable to be around. She's a good woman, Sarah. But two things can be true at the same time. I've yet to meet someone who can't be both of these. Abraham gave her Hagar, the child, sent her away because of the child's existence. I wouldn't want to be that boy. My existence is the reason I'm going, given my foolish actions. And then we have Hagar, just weeping and control. These are not tears for show because no one's watching. She's by herself. These aren't tears of I want to get what I want. These are tears of why. How can this happen? Beyond even that, to despair. So why do things happen this way? This story, 
like so many others, is meant to teach us about God, what he's like, about us and what we're like, and what he does to, to rescue us from everything that we've done. And this is what Genesis teaches. And I, I think if you don't really understand the story of Genesis, I don't think you can understand the theology of the New Testament. Just forget about it. You can't understand the, the grace that Paul talks about if you don't understand Abraham's life. Because it's just theological terms that sound really cool but don't have any real weight. It's Abraham who gives theology weight. On one hand, God must fulfill his goal. He has to be true to who he is. He's faithful. He, he will accomplish what he said he will accomplish. His son, the one that he promised to, at this point, as you look at the story, the one he promised to, really the devil, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where he says, there will be a descendant of this woman, Eve, who will crush your head. God will accomplish that. He's hard and unwavering in those kinds of promises. will not change. <coughs> This son will also come from Abraham. We learn in Genesis 12, verse 3, that the descendant of Abraham will be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And to be honest, Ishmael, at some point, will become a problem. I mean, we don't know how. The text doesn't say. But God says, Sarah's, you know, right, in a way. The child has to go. So God is protecting his promise. And he must Guarantee the promise of Ishmael does have to go. They could have done it so much better than this. They could have, you know, taken her to some other place, set her up with something, and, and been kind to her. They, they could have done better. But in a sense, you know, God is willing to work with us broken, stupid people, cold hearted people. God makes really hard choices. He must fulfill his promises so that he can accomplish his goal, which again is living among his people. Which is what you see in the end of the Bible. Jesus himself being the king. Without his holiness destroying. But on the other hand, God is just as much as he is harder than unwavering his promises. He is also compassionate to those who are cold and foolish. I mean, you would think that God could be the cold one. But it's, it's, it's us that are the cold ones. He is a faithful one. We are the faithless. He hears the cries of foolish, crying, silly boys, crying really under the wishes. He is moved to act. He is faithful to his promise despite our foolishness and unfaithfulness. And because God is compassionate, because he's true to his word, he finds a way to bless Ishmael as well. But God, it says in the next verse, heard the boys. The angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and asked her, What is the matter with Hagar? Don't be afraid, for God has heard the boy's voice, the one who caused the problem. God heard his voice. Right up, right where he was crying. Get up, help the boy, hold him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. And God enabled Hagar to see a well of water. She went over, filled the skin with water, and then gave the boy a drink. But God sees this boy. Remember, that's what Ishmael means. His name comes back into play, the meaning of his name. God notices him. He sees him. God was with the boy and grew. He lived in the wilderness and became an archer. He lived in the wilderness of Paran. His mother found a wife for him in the land of Egypt. Now, the next several verses are usually cut off and people make a bit of sermon about these next verses, or they just skip this next part. This seems like a random history. Nothing in the book of Genesis is random at all. Again, it's placed there perfectly on purpose. So after we have this great moment of birth, and you see this kind of ugly moment between Hagar and the boy, and you have, you know, um, Sorry, Sarah and the boy, and you have Hagar, and, 
And Abraham just kind of at a loss here. You have a bit of history that I think puts everything into perspective. It's this exact moment where Abraham would be really looking at the shattered mass of his own personal life because of his own bad decisions. Probably feeling enraged, feeling really stupid, feeling depressed and broken. At this exact moment, you get to see another person's point of view because this story was told from various points of view. We have Sarah's point of view for a moment there. Then you saw Abraham's point of view. And you see the, the words in the text kind of showing Abraham's grief. Then you see Hagar's point of view. And her watching all of this from her position. But now everything backs away from the whole family. And it looks at the family from an outsider point of view, Abimelech, the king. At that time, Abimelech and Bible, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Abraham, like, really? <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, I wouldn't feel like that. I feel like, you know, God is definitely out there and, and supported me sometimes, but with me? From an outsider's perspective, Abraham is unbelievably blessed. Then Abimelech says, Now swear to me right here in God's name that you will not deceive me. Why? Well, I've already done it once. My children and my descendants, show me in the land where you were staying the same loyalty that I've shown you. It's interesting. Like, why would he why would he say this? He's looking at Abraham's life and he says, I need assurances that this guy's on my side. This guy's blessed by God. I haven't had all good experiences with Abraham. I need assurances that this guy will treat me and my people well. And this is a foreigner in the land. And sure, he's wealthy. And sure, he has a large amount of people with him. But this is the king of the region coming to him to say, I need assurances that you are going to treat me well. And Abraham said, I swear to do this. But Abraham lodged the complaint, which is kind of wild, you know? That he has the confidence to do this. It's pointing out that God's blessing of Abraham is real. He lodges a complaint. And some you could translate it, but Abraham is a raid of them, which is very strong wording that is used in the Nazareth text, but it, it um it could mean reprove the one concerning a well, like a water well. It's very simple. Very dry area, water wells are everything. Um, that Abimelech's servants had apparently stolen from Abraham. Take. So Abraham brings this up. And Abimelech responds, You know, I don't know who's done this thing. And moreover, you did not tell me. I did not hear about this until today. Abraham took some sheep and cattle, gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a treaty. This is nearly a parody treaty. Treaties in this ancient world, are, they're everything. Um, before we saw a kind of suzerain vassal treaty between God himself in Genesis 15 and Abram, a suzerain, a king, a powerful king to a lesser. But this is almost a treaty between equals. This is how Abimelech, an outsider, sees Abraham, a person who's God blessed incredibly, even though Abraham certainly wouldn't feel like that right now. Then Abraham said, seven, uh, who lands apart from the flock by themselves? Abimelech asked, asked Abraham, What's the meaning of these seven lambs that you have given apart? He replied, You must take these seven lambs from my hand as legal proof that I dug this well. And this, this, this well will become kind of, and even in the future, Abraham's well. God's promise to Abraham are coming true. Abimelech comes to Abraham. Abraham points out a failing of Abimelech's people, a foreigner. And again, it's not like today where you know people have rights and stuff, okay? Uh, it's different. So the foreigner pointing out this to a king, that's kind of shocking. It's like wants to enter this treaty because it will be good for Abimelech. Abimelech knows Abraham's life is unnatural. There's like a there's there's like a feeling of something other about Abraham. That Abimelech recognizes. He also knows that it's undeserved. 
There's something about this guy that's different, that's special. The point is this. Abraham is not great because of his great skills, his ability or his willpower. Abraham is great because of the end of it. I mean, sure, he, he must be obedient, but it's given him. Didn't earn it. In fact, every time that he intervenes, he just makes it worse. And the film life recognizes that. His situation is unnaturally good. That is why Abram named the place Be'er Sheba. Because the two of them swore an oath there. Um, it means kind of the well of the oath. And it has kind of the word seven all mixed up into the, this, this name. You see this throughout the Old Testament. So they made a treaty at Be'er Sheba. And then Abimelech and Fight called the commanders are in turn to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree, which is it's usually like it's a mark of blessing. You know, he's marking the blessing in his life here in this place. There he worships the Lord, the eternal God. So Abraham stayed in the land of Philistines for quite some time. And there in chapter 9. So when you think back at all of this, it becomes clear that we could be, uh, we are often, very cold and harsh and, you know, right. And I find myself there. It's not a good place to find yourself. But you, you will, if you look at yourself, probably find yourself there sometime. Cold, harsh, and quote unquote, you know, technically right. In our imagined position of strength and righteousness. But, as it says here, our lack of sympathy and our actions betrays our heart, which is we're doing it out of fear. We're scared, we're protecting our own interests. That's what Sarah's doing. And honestly, it's what, it, it's what the boy Ishmael is also doing. He's doing the same thing, but just in like a little kid's way. Why is he mocking him? Because he's scared. He knows that that kid's way more important than he is. The real wife has, you know, the real wife has him. He, he's, he's nervous. So he, in his nervousness, is cool. Just like we are as adults. God is hard and uncompromising is what he's saying. And we can be hard and uncompromising. Mm -hmm. It's usually the wrong way. Uh, but God is uncompromising is what he's saying. At the same time, we fold, daring, and weirdly flexible. That's what we've said now for three weeks. God shows a weird flexibility that we wouldn't expect. Hard and unbending in some you know, will not change. But in other areas, he's willing to flex and change a little bit. We saw with Job. We're now seeing it with Ishmael and his mother. A believer might be right, that doesn't mean they're admirable. Emotions often make our choices for us while we justify our choices kind of rightness in order to feel good about our cold, you know, self-preservation and lack of faith. Our choices tear apart relationships. And God is there and has been for as long as we have been, picking up the pieces of all of our torn apart relationships, trying to make the best of our mess. We make cruel choices and attempt to justify them with the right reasons. God justifies the cruel, though. People like Sarah and Ishmael. And he keeps his promises to them and gives them another chance. The majority of Abraham and Sarah's story really is about the messy process that, that we go through as humans. That means we saw it. Most of the chapters is focusing on this messy process of if I showed you a chart, I used to do this when I peeked through it. Like almost every chapter is an up and then a down. Up and then a down, up and then a down. This constant failures of people, and then God coming and fixing it. And then every once in a while, people respond in faithfulness to God. And as Abraham gets older, he responds more and more to God, but it's the story of the process. While the final result of trusting God is just a few lines. 
they the of the child's born. They grossness. I think most of your life, obviously, it fits part of the process. And we focus on winning, we focus on you know, achieving what we want, we focus on success, but I think it's important to stop thinking about how to make your side win, whatever your side might be. God will win with or without us. He is going to win without our scheming and self preservation. That moment of success and winning really shouldn't be your focus. It shouldn't be my focus, but it ends up being. Your focus really should be just doing your part the best way possible right now. This is where we are. Most of your life is as it is now, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. This is how it will be. Young people, not a whole lot of you today. But uh, the way you feel now is often the way you feel most of the time. You're waiting. You're building up to something. And if you don't think so, ask an older person. Most of our, our time is in this process. The successes, the, the moments of, of feeling victory are, are short. Most of the time with the process, it turns out that process is the most important. That where you are today is the most important place. So, to those of you who are older, our purpose is this. To tell those ones of us that are younger, to tell whether they're here in this church or somewhere else, to tell the next generation about this, about God's grace, to encourage them when things go this wrong, and they will. We know, us older ones here, and those who are old, far older than me, you know things go this wrong. It happens. So it's our job to tell the next generation about, about the God who's a specialist in fixing these kinds of things. It, it doesn't mean that the pain all goes away, but he's the only one who can pick up the broken, mangled puzzle pieces and make something beautiful out of it. And that's, that's what we're doing here. That's why we meet in the church, is to tell the next generation, to encourage each other and to tell the next generation, we're not doing that not doing anything at all. So I encourage you to do that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we'll you. Um, it's really wild to see an outsider's perspective like Abimelech looking into a mess like Abraham and saying, wow, God bless me. Um, sometimes uh, I hear people say that about my family or about other people's families but I know the details of my family. I know the details of some other people's families, and it doesn't always look so successful. But Lord, to those who don't know you in the chaos of their lives, it, it's a different, there's something, there's something different about the life and family of a people and a family and a group who trust you. I pray, Lord, that we could be encouraged by a biblical looking at Abraham's mess and saying, wow, God is really faithful. Pray we can look at our own lives and say, wow, God has been faithful to us. To see that outsider's perspective. Pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Hey.